Hello, and welcome to the Sensibly Speaking podcast. This is Chris Shelton, the critical thinker at large, coming at you for show 120 something or other, uh, brought to you on Stitcher, Google Play, iTunes, and with video here on YouTube. Um, something I need to state here on the podcast uh, about last week's episode, I have put this in writing. Uh, in the places where I posted links to my interview with Jessica Shop, And the interview that I did with Jessica is totally fine, and I'm not in any way retracting anything that was talked about during the podcast. However, I need to make it clear that I and my channel in no way endorse or recommend Jessica's End of Fear project or EOF project. Uh, that is an activity she's engaged in with a man named Diego, and that is not something that, uh, because I had her on my podcast, it might be assumed that I am recommending or endorsing that people check out EOF and, and take part in it or something. And that is not the case. Uh, Jessica's project is her project, but what we talked about, and the reason I had her on my podcast was in order to talk to her about having been a cult leader in a spiritual movement and her trajectory leaving that and coming to her senses as far as <laughs> as she put it uh, waking up one day to find out you're a drug dealer right and she had been peddling uh, woo in one fashion or another to her followers and came out of that that was the point of doing that podcast so anyway I just needed to uh, tell you guys that in addition to having put it in writing where I posted the podcast so with that out of the way, now this week uh, I have Karen Schles, or sorry, Karen Presley back. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. Um, that many uh, names. Yes, yeah, so, <laughs> that's right. And we are actually this week going to talk about some Scientology stuff that I think you guys are going to find kind of fun and interesting. She put together a, um, uh, a document, a PowerPoint, uh, called 84 and Counting. And this refers to the number of books that are out there about Scientology, uh, written by former members, academics, journalists, news media, various sources. She put this together and categorized it by the various authors and sources and places where people have been writing about Scientology for many, many years. So I thought, let's have Karen on and let's go over some of this and, and sort of rabble rouse maybe a little bit about some of the particulars of some of these books and some of the more interesting facts connected with some of them. So Karen, welcome to my podcast again. Thank you. Glad to be back with you again. Yeah, I think this will be kind of interesting. Um, yeah. So your uh, first off, and, and so everybody knows this, uh, this PowerPoint or this, it's a, in a PDF form will be available uh, for download from Karen's uh, website. And we will have a link to that in the show notes. So if you guys want to, you can actually even stop right now and get that link and, and download it. So you can take a look at it and maybe follow along as we go, uh, as we walk through this thing. What was it, Karen, that prompted you to do this? What's, what, what is this whole thing about? Well, I spend quite a bit of time on Facebook, Chris, um, actually answering questions for a lot of new Scientologists that have become uh, supporters of the Leah Remini show and supporters of ex-members. Um, a lot of people have I'm sorry, we should probably clarify, you mean new Scientology watchers? New Scientology watchers, yeah. Yeah, okay, good. You said new Scientologists. <laughs> I wanted to make oh, sure no, we were, we were clear on who we're talking about here, yeah. <laughs> not new Scientologists. Right. New Scientology watchers. I mean, the show... Lee Remini's Aftermath show has obviously attracted tens of thousands of people to supportive groups. And I love this community that's been building because I've met so many people through these groups who um, really have sincere questions. They really want to know. Yes. And so I decided, you know what? You know, I'm a former English teacher. I really promote reading books. I'm an author of, you know, more than one book. And I just published my book, Escaping Scientology. So I really like to encourage people to read. Um, and since the new Scientology Watcher community is so interested in what is Scientology, and they ask a zillion questions, I thought, you know what? I'm going to put together like a library of books that people can look at 
and they can go to these books uh, and get and get their answers. And I thought you know, when I started doing this, I thought, well, you know, there's probably about 20, maybe 20 or 30 books out there in Scientology. To be honest with you, I was shocked when I finally finished at 84 books. There are 84 books out there wow. since the since the 1950s that have either published on Scientology or there's chapters about Scientology in people's books. So I thought that was pretty amazing um, just on how many people have written about Scientology, like not just first person accounts, but uh, medical doctors, psychologists, psychiatrists, um, attorneys. There's people from all walks of life that have really attacked the subject. So. I thought that it was really important to put something together like this that people could really use. Um, and while I was doing that, I ran across a document from uh, Why We Protest that, that put together a whole publication of articles. There are hundreds, hundreds of articles about Scientology on everything you could possibly imagine. Oh, yeah. And, and there is so much out there, but because it's all over the place on the Internet, sometimes it's hard to pull it together. So I put this thing together and I'm going to be posting it at my website, www.escapingscientology.com. So that's where the link will be. And when I started looking at this, I wish we could pull the PowerPoint up while we're talking, but they'll, they'll be able to do that. I think while they're listening, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that, um, you know, Scientology came out, well, Dianetics um, came out in, in 1950, Science of Survival came out in 52, and by by 52, there were already books coming out to dispute Hubbard's claims, and the first one that came out was written by a medical doctor who said, who actually assessed Dianetics, and then, you know, starting, there was only one book that came out in the 60s, and then in the 70s, the book started flooding out. And then when you think about what was going on in Scientology in the 70s and in the 80s, right? People had already uh, joined the Sea Org and already started coming out of the Sea Org, right? And started making known what had gone on on the internal networking of Scientology. But because there was no internet, um, Scientology was able to suppress all the information except for the books that did make it out. So when you look at the PowerPoint and you look at like in the 1970s or the 1980s, I have some notes here. Um, in the 1970s, 11 books were already out on Scientology. And if you look at some of those books, those are like some of the most famous SP names that we've ever known, including Paulette Cooper. Yeah, right? that's right. Um, and so, you know, people that were writing books in those days had guts. They had courage because the church was tearing people up. Yes, who, it was. Oh, yeah. Who, who dared to write a book. And uh, as I was putting this together, I thought, damn, Scientology was involved in book banning. Book yeah. banning. Yeah. Censorship, denial of public of public access to information, you know, since the 70s. Um, so if you notice, if you look through the um, presentation, there's only um, in 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 the early days, there were a lot of books like 11 books in the 1970s from 1980 to 1989, only six books made it out. And when you think about it, you got to ask, why was that? What was going on in Scientology where only six books made it out? It's because um, the GO, well, previously, and then OSA was all over it. That's they right. were literally they were literally stealing books from libraries. They had operations all over the country where they would send people into libraries to steal every copy of anything ever said about Scientology. And they would trash it. And then the libraries would think that the books were stolen or That's right. lost. That's right. But it's it's quite interesting. It's quite interesting, yeah. That in fact one of the books on the list is a book about somebody else writing a book. <laughs> I mean there's Tony Ortega's book 
about Paulette Cooper, right? Which is yeah, basically, yeah. you know, her story of, of having written her book, The Scandal of Scientology, and then the aftermath and consequences that she dealt with from the Church of Scientology, stalking, harassing, and trying to set her up uh, through the 1970s and 80s. So it was definitely, um, I, I'm quite sure that, you know, her reputation uh, got around, you know, in writer circles and whatnot, reporter journalist circles as well, and the litigiousness of Scientology through the 70s and 80s, because that was their heyday of litigation. Oh, you know, 80s, uh, 80s and 90s. Yeah. 80s and 90s. During that time, I mean, I left the Sea Org in 1998. I got my first book contract in 2000 with Broadman and Holman. And at, that was when I discovered that Scientology had the reputation as the most litigious organization in the United States. That's right. This quote-unquote church <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, as a matter of fact my first book was supposed to come out in 2001 with through Broadman and Holman but you know like all the other authors that had tried to get books out I was subject to the same fair game tactics and in my case uh, their attorney Elliot Abelson went to my publisher and threatened my publisher with a, a minimum of a $500,000 fine if they publish my book. So here's Scientology trying to suppress my freedom of speech, right? Just They just didn't want my book out. So they levied this threat for 500000 saying that I had signed a bond of confidentiality that I never signed. But they, Elliot Abelson, their attorney, lied to my publisher's attorney and said that I had signed this document, which I never signed. And so I can only imagine the kind of lies and threats that they used to all these other offers prior to my day of what they did to try to suppress that book. Like, you're bringing up Paulette Cooper. Look at what Tony Ortega exposed that Paulette went through. They nearly ruined her. She almost died from poor health. They almost bankrupted her. And that's the extent that they would go to control information about themselves. So, right. you know, all, all I could do is get excited as I'm working on this presentation, looking at how many books are finally coming out um, and freaking Scientology out because there was nothing they could do because of the Internet. The Internet was their, their worst nightmare. So right. in my presentation, you'll see... Okay, so almost no books are coming out before 1999, like a total of six in 10 years. That's how much they suppress publication. Then from 2000 to 2007, only four books came out in seven years. Wow. And, it, and that was the time my book was supposed to, my first book was supposed to come out in 2001, and my second book was supposed to come out in 2006. So that's when the attorneys were all over it. They were doing everything they could. They were stealing books from the libraries. They were suppressing publication and all that stuff. So in 2009, the dam broke. And you remember what happened in 2008, 2009. Oh, yes. Well, that's okay. when Scientology got defanged in a fairly large way, uh, you know, rather publicly by Anonymous. It was in 2008. Anonymous. Good point. Good point. Oh, you had something else in mind. That was certainly the first thing I thought of from that time period <laughs> because Scientology was faced with an enemy they had no clue how to deal with. And their and their dirty laundry was being aired internationally across the internet uh, in a way that and be, and they were being publicly protested, at, you know, in massive in a massive uh, demonstra series of demonstrations. Uh, from Anonymous that w was, I mean, they, in the end, I think Scientology maybe found out, you know, the names of about four or five of those guys that they could do something about, but there were thousands and thousands of people in front of churches marching around and uh, exposing all their secrets and dirty laundry to the entire world. So that was something they couldn't litigate against effectively. It was the most awesome show of for freedom of speech. That's right. That that I've personally ever experienced in my lifetime. Yep. Because I've never gone through a phase in my history 
when anyone was suppressing my First Amendment freedom of speech. That was the first time. And, you know, I was in the Sea Org up until 1998, so I had no knowledge of the Internet, right? So when I, you know, thank God for the Internet. But by 2008, okay, so your point about anonymous, that is exactly, that's powerful. And also what happened in 2008 was that people started leaving the int base. Oh. The major exodus started happening in 2008. Oh, that's Um, interesting. Yeah. In 2008, that actually triggered, I'm looking right now at the presentation. In 2008, between 08 and 09, eight books came out during that time. It was big coincident with Anonymous and people peeling out of the int base. Um, Mark Headley's book came out in 2009, Blown for Good. And, of course, you remember before his book came out, he was leaking information. Oh, yeah. From 2005 forward, I think, is when he started appearing yeah. in on uh, X Scientology message board or Xenu.net yeah. and he was posting under the anonymous under the name blown for good or BFG right. and nobody remember, knew who he was nobody knew who he was nobody knew where this information was coming from that's right it they were so trying exciting. desperately to figure it out and it according really to exciting. yeah and according to Mark they figured out that it was him but, but, but Miscavige wouldn't believe it no way that's Headley. Absolutely not. No way. And then t- 2009, out comes Blown for Good, and guess whose name is on the cover? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was such a coup. I loved it. Um, yep. But interesting, his was not the first to come out. Um, actually, the first Sea Org member that I found in my presentation was actually... Monica Pignotti's mm. book came out in, let's see, 1989. That was the first Sea Org book that came out that I could find. Okay. Now, other books had come out by ex-members, like, of course, John Atack. Mm-hmm. You know, his his book started coming out in 1990. Uh, Bent Cor- in 1990 was John Atack, uh, Bent Corydon, um, Mad Men or Messiah, and uh, Gottfried Hellwein was a celebrity at a German celebrity from CC. His book came out in like '97. That freaked okay. everybody out. That you know, do you remember what an SP name that was, Gottfried Hellwein? It was never. It never came across my plate. Oh really? Well, I was no. at CC, so yeah, I know. was over in Pack, and his name just never registered at all with us. Some German it guy, yeah. Su- it was such a nightmare. Are you kidding me? A celebrity publishes a book, you know, wow. about Scientology. So, and then, um, so from 2000 to 2007, like I said, only four books came out, one of which was Steve Kent's book, who has appeared on Aftermath. But the point I wanted to get at was between 2008 and 09, when all these people started coming out of the Sea Org, then you start getting uh, like this onslaught of freedom of speech. Mark Headley's was in 2009. Nancy Maney's came out. Um, My Billion Year Contract. Um, Let's see, Bonnie Wood's book came out. Of course, Andrew Morton's book on Tom Cruise came out that year. And to me, what was really pivotal about these books, as an author, what mattered to me is that attorneys were, uh, or Scientology attorneys were threatening lawsuits, like to St. Martin's Press for Andrew Morton, but no lawsuit was ever filed. Right. And it was a threat that never made it to the courts or even to the paperwork. And this was a breaking point for freedom of speech. This was a breaking point for people to feel that they could actually write a book and get it published. Yep. And that's, I think, why I said earlier that the church had been defanged. It's yes. not, and it's interesting. It's a very interesting thing because it's not that they didn't continue to have the financial resources or legal resources to go after people the way they had been, the way they'd even gone after you when you were trying to publish back in 2000, 2001, right? Um, mm-hmm. They still had those same resources, but some decision clearly got made at some level, I assume Miscavige's, 
to not pursue the legal you know route anymore as stringently or as as, as ruthlessly really uh as they had been and i i'd always looked at anonymous as one of the as one of the catalysts for that and maybe the volume of material i'm really not sure uh because a lot of those members that you mentioned in front who published books in 2009 had left much earlier it wasn't like all those people left in 2008 and right. immediately sat down and wrote books. Some of the Nancy yeah. Manny had been out for quite a while. Right. Uh, Mark Headley had been out for four years at that point. So it yep. was sort of like a, a a coming together of various things that just sort of made it the the perfect time for all that stuff to happen. Yeah, it was kind of a perfect storm. I think mm -hmm. one of the things that they that happened at that time too is because of the volume coming out. I think that Scientology was not wanting to um, try to stop these books or take people to court because it was going to cause so much publicity for them. That's right. And it, it just would have caused the books to sell more. Like, for example, when my book came out in 2017 in September uh, and they aired that trash video on me to try to damage me right afterwards, yep. my book sales went up because of that. Exactly. So, as nasty as that video was, it it drew a lot of attention to to, to my book. Well, and that's so, because any publicity is better than no publicity. You know, <laughs> it's a saying. It's out there. You know, I mean, any news. You know, any news is better than no news, right? Uh, and I experienced the exact same thing. I mean, with the websites that they do, they didn't respond to my book at all when I published my book in um, two thousand. I think it was fifteen, but. Uh, but the website, you know, they when I, after I was on Leah's show, man, my subscribers, my Twitter followers, like everything just spiked after that. And I know, so I, I was it. kind of like, it really sucked that they, you know, made a website about me and have my ex-wife trashing me. But, you know, pretty ineffective if they were if they if the effort was to trash me. Uh, yeah, right. that epic fail, guys. You know, I know. Epic fail. And, and good for us, right? Yeah. So after that, interesting, right after um, Nancy Maney's book came out and Mark Headley's book came out, so from 2010 to 2012, eight more books came out. Wow. Hey, we went for years with nobody ever getting their book out. So we have eight books uh, between 08 and eight more books from 2010 to 2012. And now we have Jefferson Hawkins. Counterfeit Dreams. Um, he actually wrote another one too. Um, Amy Scobie's book, Abuse at the Top. Abuse at the Top. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, and then um, Marty Rathbun's book. Actually, Jeff Hawkins wrote two books, Leaving Scientology and Counterfeit Dreams. Steve Hassan's book came out, Freedom of Mind, which was an amazing mm. book. On um, that book, between that and Combating Cult Mind Control, those books have given me so much meat that I needed to help put my mind back together. Yes, I agree, um, I agree completely. Did you read his books? Oh, yeah. Well, I've read Combating Cult Mind Control. That was one of the first books I read when I came out of Scientology. And it was oh, the really? very first me book too. I read that had to do with cults um, as, a, as a formal book on the subject and how to yeah. deal with, you know, dealing with cults and, and cult the cult experience and and dealing with people who are in a cult and, and how to talk to them and that sort of thing. And a uh, very, very eye-opening book for me. Yeah, me too, Chris. Uh, yeah. I thought that that was, it was really came at the right time for me. Yep. Um, so, wow. Um, Marjorie Wakefield wrote a couple books. Marty Rathbun started publishing, you know, his whole deal on Scientology. I almost didn't include his books here, but I wanted it to be part of the documentation who who am i to judge the content of his book right well Never. no absolutely i mean it's a historical fact that he wrote those books the fact that he's yeah. reneged on them now doesn't take away from the fact that he wrote those books and the things that he wrote in them are you know we can take for whatever value we want to assign to them at this point right and it's it's important to have it out there so then major major uh breakthrough in 2013 12 books came out in 2013. Wow. 
I mean, what was going on in Scientology maybe a year before that? Twelve books made it out in 2013. John Sweeney's book, Church of Fear. Mm -hmm. Lewis Catton's book about Narconon. Another John Atak book. Um, Hugh Urban, who is mm. an academic, wrote one about Scientology. Um, an author wrote about William S. Burroughs' experience in Scientology. That was interesting. Um, Kate Bor Borglin, A Queer and Pleasant Danger. That's the first book that I've ever seen anybody write about being gay in Scientology or what was it like to be a Scientologist and be dealt with as a gay person. Right. So um, pretty important book. Another Marty Rathbun book came out, and then Janet Janet Reitman's book came out. Oh, Escaping Scientology. Scientology, right. Yeah. Well, or Inside Scientology, right. Inside Scientology, um, and of course she wrote the Rolling Stone article before the book came out. Right. But key key book, Jenna Miscavige's book came out in 2013. Okay. So you have the first Miscavige book that comes out, and at that point, I think that's really interesting that by 2013, well, his father is still in. I think he left in 2012, actually. Mm. Didn't Ron Miscavige leave in 2012? Quietly. quietly. Very quietly. But, but right. so Ron's granddaughter's book comes out in 2013, and, um, and Lawrence Wright's book comes out, Going Clear. Right. All in 2013. Mega change about public perception of Scientology because of that's these right. books. That's right. That's right. And and Lawrence Wright's book had been preceded by the New Yorker article called The Apostate. Right. That, that was his first work on it, and then he exp and then he expanded out and wrote wrote Going Clear. With Paul Haggis. That's yeah. right. So after that, it's like the dam breaks. It's it's amazing if you look at um, from 2014 to 2015. 12 more books come out, and then from 2016 to 17, 13 books come out. Wow. Now, wait, now we have 84 books out on Scientology. Wow. It's like, it, you know, if you were to go to a publisher and say, you know, I want to write a book about Scientology, and they would say, well, how much demand is there on the subject? 84 books and still counting. Fascinating. And I wonder how much of that has had a sort of quiet effect on the entire anti-Scientology movement or community or whatever. How many of those books have created people in these communities, right? Because, um, and then, of course, Leah's show comes along, you know, last year as well. Um, but I wonder, these, these, these books being out there for all these years, how many people have been just kind of picking them up off the shelves or at the library and reading them. And then, you know, a little bit more awareness about this thing. And then they see Going Clear come out and they go, oh, yeah, I want to go see that. Or they see Leah's show, oh, yeah, I want to watch that. And it just gets, you know, even more snowballing. Yeah, interesting stuff. Um, well, not, not just not knowing about, sorry, I cut you off just one thing, but I just... Yeah. I'm just kind of fascinated by this because I hadn't seen these numbers until you just read them out to me. I did not realize so much literature was out there by former members, academics, you know, and uh, and media members on this topic over all these years. And this is definitely a factor to uh, include in the equation of Scientology's, you know, toxicity. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. When you think about it, I mean... In 2017, Stephen Kent at the University of Alberta published a textbook on Scientology. Mm -hmm. Scientology he sent me a copy of it. It's awesome. <laughs> it, Scientology in popular culture. Mm -hmm. And I really missed out on something. He invited me to co-author a chapter in that book. Mm. On celebrities, it, it had to do with... Uh, celebrity in pop culture, like the celebrity culture in religion. And I was supposed to co-author a chapter on that. And I was in the process of moving and just couldn't make it happen time-wise. But anyway, um, I thought that it was pretty significant that out of all these books, um, there are a total of something like 13 books 
written by academics, religious scholars. And what these people have done is, you know, they've looked at like how Scientology impacts the world from a social perspective or a religious perspective, and they come up with a theory, and then they exa examine all the literature out there, and they form hypotheses and write conclusions. And then now students are studying about this in universities. And, you know, to me, this is, a, it, it's an outstanding development in, in like what books have done to raise people's awareness because in the 1980s, nobody even understood what Scientology was. And you couldn't even get anyone to explain what is Scientology, what does it believe. And now we have 84 books on the subject. Very much so. The amount of information out there is a, is a wealth of material. I do yeah. have to comment on one thing about what you just said in terms of the academics. Yeah. Um, only because on this channel there is an entire playlist, uh, which is a, a you know, long series of videos, deconstructing one of those academic books. And which that, one? that book is called Scientology, and it was edited by James R. Lewis. And I took that book apart because it was almost cover to cover Scientology apologism. Uh, it, it read like an apologist work uh, from academics who were favorable and uh, basically promoting Scientology throughout the book. So yeah. you do have an interesting thing in the academic world in regards to Scientology and other uh, cultic groups where they are, uh, some people in the academic world feel that it's their duty to support the First Amendment to the Constitution, freedom of religion, by labeling some of these groups like Scientology a new religious movement rather than calling them what it really is, which is a destructive cult. And, they, and their papers tend to side more in the direction of taking what Scientology gives them and then just rehashing or repeating that rather than critically looking at the material that Scientology gives them and looking at how is this material actually used in the real world, they don't really necessarily always take that next step. Now, there are academics like Stephen Kent, uh, Hugh Urban to some degree, right, but there are others who are have a much more critical eye when it comes to looking at what Scientology is really up to and what it's actually, does it practice what it preaches? You're 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 absolutely right. I um, it's a really good point because <clears throat> I encountered a J. Gordon Melton. Yes. Uh, very early on, after I left Scientology, when I started to attend the International Cultic Studies Association conferences, mm -hmm. and Melton would come to these conferences, and he he and a group of a, a few other quote unquote religious study scholars were on on one side of the fence regarding cult apologism. And those of us that were on the other side of the fence were the ones that would do more critical thinking analysis of and not, not take what Scientology and other cults fed us, but we would actually uh, examine it. And right. we would consider first-person accounts, and we would, can, we would compare it to the, the other research. But this is a good point. This is one of the reasons why I wanted to do this talk because there are tens of thousands of new people, new watchers, who want to read books about Scientology. So this is a good time to sort of help give them a helpful tip. Yep. If you if you want and and let me know if you agree with me on these points. First of all, if if a new watcher wants to read books about Scientology, I would recommend that they read books by ex Sea Org members first because an ex Sea Org member is um, within the management it's it's within that mindset that a Scientologist would never have mm -hmm. a Sea Org member has is privy to a very unique mindset a whole different set of rules uh, a whole different set of expectations and behavior and psychological trauma, and all that goes along with being in Sea Org. That's right. So if if you really want to read a book and really find out about Scientology, read a book by a Sea Org member. Would you agree with that? I would. 
I would definitely one because it gives you uh, a what goes on behind closed doors, mm-hmm. right? Because you get the inside skinny on what really goes on in those closed off buildings behind the you know barbed wire fences, and two, right. you are getting a look at what is probably I would describe as the purest form of Scientology. Mm. Right. These are people who practice. Sea Org members are people who have dedicated their lives to the cause. They have signed a billion year contract, which is, you know, symbolic or not, but they believe it. And Mm -hmm. they are doing nothing all day, every day, except practicing Scientology. That's all they're doing. So Mm -hmm. they have every vested interest, every, you know, everything they're in their being is directed to taking what Hubbard said in his numerous policies, in his numerous bulletins, in his numerous books and lectures, trying to understand it, trying to reconcile all of it together into a coherent whole, and delivering that to others, right, and uh, and to themselves, with the with the end in mind of creating a cleared planet, right, saving the world with Scientology. So. So you're you're looking at that's what I mean when I say it's the purest form of Scientology. Yeah. This is this is what Scientology is at its core is the Sea Org. So if you if you exactly. if, you know so if you take everything and you add it all up, you get the Sea Org. So and to, and to add to that beautiful description that you just gave, talk about purest. There are many Sea Org members who came from the Ant Base who were involved in writing some of the tech. Yes, good point. Very good point. That's right. <laughs> writing some of some many of the Knots rundowns. Writing the key to, the key to life book, the life orientation. I mean, all the so all much. the basics books that were rehashed. An, you know, yeah, an endless list. The uh, translations, the edits, the edits yeah. um, that were made by RTC and ABC. So you're talking, you know, the core purity there. That's so right. I would recommend book to read books by Sea Org members. Yep. You will gain information that nobody else could possibly give. So that's why I, when I made the presentation, I put books by Sea Org members in their own category. And those are the ones that I would strongly recommend to new watchers. The second group would be from ex-Scientologists. Yep. Ex Scientologists have a whole other set of experiences. That's right. You know, that I don't even have. I, I was never a flag public before I was, you know, I was a celebrity center public, but people who were flag public, who grinded it out to get through solo nuts, years of solo auditing, and spending all that money and all those sec checks and it's an insane lifestyle. So those are, wow. Well, absolutely. Then, you know, short of a Sea Org experience, I think it's arguable that a Scientology uh, public auditing on OT7, that auditing at the highest levels of the bridge, is experiencing some of the most psychologically and emotionally damaging material of Scientology. And they're absolutely. doing it, when they're doing it on OT5, 6, and 7, you know, they, they're grinding it out for years on that level. Nobody does OT7 in a couple months. Exactly. Nobody. It then, takes years. And then know. they land on the ship to do OT8. Yeah. You yeah. Know? And, and look at the horror stories we have now coming out in books and in articles from people who escaped. That's right. Um, so after that category, then in, in the presentation, there's a whole group of books written by journalists. Mm-hmm. Okay, so for the benefit of people who are looking to read books on Scientology, if you read a book by a journalist, just realize that you're going to get a very well-researched book, but this research is going to be done through interviews of people who have experienced it. The journalist, him or herself, hasn't necessarily experienced it. You know, So they get it through second-person stories. Now, arguably, Lawrence Wright's book, Going Clear, Tony Ortega's book on Paulette Cooper, I mean, they did phenomenal research and work. Yes. Those are, those are amazing accomplishments. Um, but, you know, a journalist writes a book with an angle. 
it's not it's not an approach to, to tell some entire truth. There's a particular storyline and there's an angle there, and and they're oh, going to sure. cover that story in full. I'm just saying this for the benefit of people who are looking for books to read, right? You got to realize what you're going to get when you buy that type of book. Oh, absolutely. Uh-huh. And another point to make about those journalist books, though, that uh, in their favor is those books, uh, almost by law, or at least in order to get published, uh, were fact-checked up one side and yes. down the other. Because yes. while us former members are writing you know, memoirs or writing about our experiences, I mean, my book is an exception because it's not a memoir, but, but for the most part, ex-members are writing what are the equivalent of biographies or, or memoirs. Um, so you're not going to, you know, you don't really have to worry too much about you know, getting sued or something like that, because it's, you know, it's your story. I mean, what are you going to tell, you know, what, I'm, you know, it's my story as, as I see it. Right. A journalist, Mr. Objective, third party, you know, looking at a, a condition or a situation, um, they got it, they got to get it right. And they can be, they and their publishing company can be taken to task if they're, if they don't. So the fact checking that also goes along with that is something I think that I should just, you know, wanted to put out there because um, cause you're going to get some amazing stories from some of those journalists, too, even yeah. though they are approaching it from whatever angle they're approaching it from. Oh, I, I think, you know, the, the library of Scientology would not be complete without the journalist books, because when you nope. think about somebody like Tony Ortega, who no one else has taken the time to connect all the dots about what Scientology did to Paulette Cooper. And that's an important piece of history, you know. Big time. In terms Big of, time. you know, uh, a pr- suppression and freedom of speech, et cetera. And even going clear how he threaded so many people's stories together that would otherwise never have been known about. Yep. There would be no public access to that information. So they're invaluable. They're just a different perspective, but they're invaluable. And then the last group within the presentation. Let me, I, I'm, I'm sorry, before we get to that last group, I just got to yeah. plug one other book in that, in that category uh, because it is without question the definitive work on L. Ron Hubbard's life, and that is Russell Miller's um, Barefaced Messiah. Yes. Which was published in the late 80s. Uh, and that was, Russell Miller was never a Scientologist, he was a journalist. And right. it was probably one of the most researched books ever written on Scientology. The man interviewed hundreds of people, as I understand it, and traveled around to Hubbard's hometown, went around to all the places he lived. So uh, people always fall back to that one. If you want to know about L. Ron Hubbard, that's the book to read, you know. Yes, I absolutely agree. That's a great point, as well as John Atax. I mean, John Atax, yes. a piece of blue sky, and everything John Atax has written is drawn from by every journalist and everybody else who writes a book, uses John Atax's book as like a almost a, a, a foundational point, you know. That's right. That's, a, that's a, a piece of blue sky. Or let's yeah, sell them a piece, a of, piece blue of blue sky. sky. And right. he, he released that um, in an updated version more recently, which is in the presentation. He's, he's released three different books. If I were to trust anybody about L. Ron Hubbard information, it would be John Atack and as well Russell Miller. Well, you know, John Atack, of course, worked with Russell Miller. <laughs> when Russell Miller right, was right. researching Barefaced Messiah, you know, and they, so and they talk yeah. about each other and they they talk about each other in their book reviews as well. So that's, that's right. That's, that's right. Great. And yeah. John Atack, for those who don't know, he's a, he is a former member. He's not a journalist. Yes. So his his book will be found in the former members category. But it's it's very uh, amazingly researched. John Atack's work is. Yeah, his book uh, is stands above the rest in terms of former members, for sure. And uh, and then, of course, the last group we were talking about, fascinating, fascinating group of books, medical doctors. There's, I, I didn't even know, but there's an attorney that wrote a book about what he went through to represent several court cases. And I understand that there's some books coming out in 2018 uh, by a very well-known attorney. Have you heard about that one? 
No. I, I didn't even include it on my list. I sort of forgot about it, but I heard, I know that he's writing a book. Wow. Um, well, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, that will be amazing. Um, uh, there's more books coming out. And then, and of course, in the last year, uh, of course, Leah Remney, her book came out in 2016. She was a celebrity Scientologist and a Sea Org member, a very unique combination of person. Um, and so, of course, her book has been groundbreaking. So all we can well, do Well, it's is- certainly got the Scientology story out because she was a celebrity mm-hmm. uh, to a lot more people than, um, you know, have probably over the years purchased, uh, say, Russell Miller's book or Johnny Tech's book or my right. book. Um, because just because she's, you know, who she is. Exactly. Well, you know, I am hoping once this presentation gets out, I'm hoping people go through it and see, wow, there are so many other stories to read, things to know about, you know, because without this, without somebody saying what's out there, you just don't know. No, it's a good point. And there, and there is a wealth of information. I doubt uh, if you'd asked me before we started doing this podcast how many books there were out there about Scientology, I would not have said 84. <laughs> what would <laughs> no. you have said? Maybe probably more along the lines of about 30 or maybe 40. Yeah. You know, yeah. from what I'm familiar with and what, what I have on my own shelf and what I've seen or have soft copy. Yeah. Uh, you know, because I have a I have a lot of literature on Scientology on my on my hard drive now. Uh, <laughs> but I don't have all these books. Well, there's a couple books that I would like to talk about for a few yeah. minutes before we go. One of them. Um, well, is this there is this amazing one called Scientology A to Zenu? Oh, yeah. That is an amazing book. <laughs> I think everybody ought to buy that one. Oh, for sure. For sure. A- no, I'm sorry. They, what were you going to... After they read Escaping Scientology, <laughs> an insider's true story. Exactly. <laughs> exactly, folks. Karen's book. <laughs> your your book and my book came out within two years of each other. So yep. great minds think alike. Wouldn't you say, Chris? Absolutely. <laughs> but what um, book were you referring but to? There's, there's a couple of other books that I think are going to be pretty controversial that I didn't even know existed until I was doing this. Yeah. One, one of them is a book that came out by Stephen Douglas called Human Trafficking by the U- U.S. Church of Scientology. Did you huh. even know that existed? Nope. That came out in, t- in 2014. And I'm going to try to find a copy of that because Stephen Douglas... Human trafficking in U.S. Scientology. Huh. I'm looking through the thing here to see if I can find it right now. Yeah. Interesting. Human trafficking. Um, Very interesting topic because several of us who have written books cover uh, the topics of slavery Mm -hmm. and human trafficking, but we touch on it. This is a an entire book dedicated to the subject, which I wow. think is pretty significant. As a matter of fact, um, uh, in about two weeks in Clearwater, there's an event on human trafficking and slavery. Have you heard about that? No. One of the churches in Clearwater, I think it's the Presbyterian Church, is holding a community event on the topic of human trafficking and slavery. Oh, I think I did see something about this on Facebook. Wasn't Scientology trying to talk at it or something? I hadn't heard that. Oh, okay, good. But Maybe I'm thinking of a different event where they were... Oh, that was... there. No, I'm sorry. I'm confusing that with an earlier event where there was a, uh, an FBI spokesperson or something was going to speak on human trafficking and it was sponsored by or somehow right. put on by Scientology. And we actually got that one shut down because it was just such a blatant hypocrisy on the part of Scientology <laughs> that... We just couldn't. I mean, I'm all about supporting education and activism about human trafficking, but not when Scientology is sponsoring it. I'm sorry, but that's just too. <laughs> that was over the no. top. Over yeah, the top. no, that's right. Um, well, I'm going to attend that human trafficking event with Dee Findley. Great. Dee Findley and I are going. And there may be other um, ex members that are, will be attending, but we'll let you know what happens. Um, another book that came out in 2015 called Arrows in the Dark by Meryl Veneer. Are you familiar yes, with that? Yes, I am, because Tony wrote about it. 
Yes, Tony Wright I haven't, got it. Yeah. Go ahead. I, haven't, I haven't read the book myself, but I do know who uh, Meryl is, and I know the subject matter of the book, because it's kind of uh, a, a bit of Scientology apologism, as I understand it. I haven't even read it yet. Um, okay. Actually, uh, someone just, Tom Padgett just lent it to me, and I just oh, okay. got it, so I'm going to read it, but, you know, I have trouble, you know, dealing with the issue of the fact that Meryl Veneer was, he was in counterintelligence, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So how do you, how, and I know that he's trying to clear his name, so how do you believe someone who was in counterintelligence? It's a difficult task when it comes to somebody who, the reason why it's difficult to believe, I think, in some respects, from what I understand of the book, is because he's still using in the book some of the rationalization or justification that was used to engage in some of those counterintelligence activities back then. In other words, he's still kind of got some of the Scientology OSA mindset. Right. And I think that's probably one reason why one would cast suspicion on that book. Not not because the events didn't happen necessarily, but you're also going to read in the middle of the event it, why the event happened according to a Scientology rationalization of it. Now, I say that not having read the book. Right. So, disclaimer. I, I could that. be totally wrong, and if I am... Go ahead and correct me on it. But that's my understanding of the book. <laughs> well, I I also, you know, Tony Ortega has done a lot of research into Meryl mm -hmm. Veneer's activities and Gabe Cesaris. And he's done he's done some really thorough reporting on those topics. So I think it's important that anyone who reads a book like that also does their own research outside that book to get the other side of the story. That's right. And that could be true for a lot of books. I well, mean, I would actually put that disclaimer on any of these books, including mine, right? I mean, I, I did my best to be as honest and forthright and truthful as I could be with the research that I did and my own experiences talking about Scientology. But if I got something wrong, you know, I got something wrong. And uh, anybody is capable of making mistakes like that, and, it's, and I would never recommend to anyone that they just take one source of information and right. run with it as the only authority on, on a thing, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I didn't mean to look away from you, but I'm, I'm looking at the presentation because there's a book in here that I am fascinated about. Yeah. Didn't know it, didn't know it existed. It's the story of a guy who, um, a Scientologist who went to see a psychiatrist. And he wrote a book called The Psychiatrist Who Cures the Scientologist. Have you seen that book? I have never even heard of that book. Yeah. I, I found it when I was doing this research. Wow. And it is it is definitely included in here. I'm, I'm paging right now. for the, There it is right there. Let me enlarge this. It's by Aaron David Gottfried. It's called The Psychiatrist Who Cured the Scientologist. Huh. And this is, I'm, I'm just going to read just a little bit of mm -hmm. description. I am fascinated by this, and I'm probably going to order it. The Scientologist, or the psychiatrist who cured the Scientologist is the story of Aaron David Gottfried's struggle with bipolar mental illness and the misinformed guidance of Scientology. The author of this book was brought up in a Scientology family and suffered the consequences of Scientology's institutionalized hostility to psychiatry. He developed bipolar disorder, which was ineffectively treated, quote unquote, treated with Scientology. It was not until he left the church and approached a psychiatrist that he actually found relief from his symptoms. We should remember that he had been taught that psychiatry was a worldwide conspiracy to oppress and exploit mankind, which had been responsible for, among other things, the Nazi Holocaust. It was a brave thing to do for this man. This book describes the author's experience with both the Church of Scientology and the profession that is demonized by it. Um, he's appeared on daytime TV and has done some interviews. I personally think this book is really significant because I'm on many uh, Facebook pages where there are people who post, um, they share experiences and they say, 
you know, what do you think about going to counseling? Like they're afraid to ask the question even. Mm -hmm. And um, I talked with someone just last week about how Scientology has so implanted us with phobias against uh, psychiatric treatment, psychological counseling of any kind. And there's so many ex-Sea Org members who currently suffer from PTSD. And the only way to treat that is to get some therapy. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, a lot of us who have needed that help um, are like trapped in these phobias against going to see a psychologist. That's right. Or someone someone who could actually help us. And I found it quite liberating when Leah uh, said on Aftermath, she said that she had been going to therapy. Big time. Big time. It, I, had a, I had a whole liberating. struggle with that myself. Mm-hmm. Me too. It's a, yeah, I, I'm, I think we all did. Because the indoctrination, I mean, it's hard to... It's hard to appreciate the level of indoctrination in Scientology against psychiatry, right? And psycho and and you know by uh, association psychology, and anything having to do with mental health treatment. I mean, they are rabid dog attack against anything having to do with this, right? And it's all from Hubbard. I mean, he he was vicious about psychiatry and. Uh, and he, he had never had a kind word to say about it, uh, especially when he let his hair down and he really had at it. You know, when he was behind closed doors, there was a Class 8 lecture where he just flat out goes into it, uh, how he really feels about these guys. And if you didn't get the idea before, you definitely get it in this lecture. I mean, he's just, these people are evil incarnate as far as he's concerned. Yeah. So that that filters into every Scientologist's head, and unless you go in there, either, uh, you know, there are some Scientologists who just kind of are able to resist that whole indoctrination; they don't get into it too much. But most of us bought it hook, line, and sinker. Yeah, there's there's no question. I I I would I would actually shudder to know how many people actually suffer from PTSD. Um, you know, I, I had PTSD, mm -hmm. and uh, I went to, I think I might have told you this before, but when I was in college, we they actually made counselors available to college students, so it was an easy in for me. Mm. I didn't have to go through, you know, going to some outside source to, to find, like, who, who would I talk to? How do you find somebody? I was talking with a friend about this a couple of weeks ago, and he said, how do I find somebody I can trust? And one of the biggest issues is to talk to a counselor, a psychologist, who doesn't know anything about cults, okay? You're gonna spend how many hours explaining to them what it's like having been in a cultic environment. You're gonna use terminology. You're, you've got to explain the manipulation of the mind. And so I was telling my friend, the International Cultic Studies Association has a whole list of mental health professionals around the world, actually, Canada, Europe, and the United States, that are uh, licensed mental health professionals who know about cults. Yep. So I guess what I'm saying is I recommend that you contact somebody like ICSA, International Cultic Studies Association, if you are looking for a counselor to talk to especially if you think you have symptoms of PTSD because you know what PTSD does not have to be permanent and there are many of us living with nightmares you know 10 years after we've gotten out fears about being pulled back into the sea or you know I don't mean to trigger anybody listening to this but I had terrible terrible screaming nightmares about being pulled back into the Sea Org. I used to hear David Miscavige's voice telling me that I couldn't leave. And right. that was part of it for me. I hated going to bed at night because when I would sleep, that's where all the trouble began. And mm. that, that was part of my PTSD. So I, I got it handled. I, I mean, I'm, I'm a lucky one who found a counselor who knew about cults 
and I didn't have to spend a lot of money because it went through my college. But I really encourage anybody to read books about PTSD um, and go to go to counseling. Get over the phobia. Just take the first step. Big and, time. And do it. You know. Big time. So. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I think well, I've. I think I've run the gamut of my comments. <laughs> no, it's great because we're actually just needing to, uh, we're reaching the end of our time here. So this is, uh, oh, okay. I think, I think we've covered a lot of very good territory. I, again, this, uh, this, this presentation Karen put together will be available on links here on the show notes. Do check it out. Um, I, I, I am myself sitting here right now learning things about this and it's not like I've, you know, think of myself as the world's past master or something when it comes to Scientology. There's still tons to learn. But to find out some of these books have existed uh, and were published, you know, within the last couple of years, yeah, that's, that's good to know. Yeah. So, so thanks for putting this together, great. Karen. This is a really great tool. Oh, you're welcome. And I hope a lot of people take a look at it. I will have it on the website. And um, let's pass it around so that people can you know, take advantage of it and learn about these books that are out there that they can read. That's right. That's right. Okay, good, folks. And, uh, yeah, and after you get finished reading Scientology at Zenu, then you read <laughs> Escaping Scientology by Karen Presley, okay? <laughs> and then you tackle the rest of the books in sequence on the, on the list here. There you here. go. <laughs> And, uh, and, and you will have a very well-rounded education on the entire subject. I, All right. Chris, we got to start some sort of a reading contest. <laughs> or a Riz Scientology book club or something. Yeah, or get people to donate books to their libraries, knowing oh, that Scientology is going to go in there and steal them out of the library. Yeah, right. That's a good idea. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, let's go ahead and wrap this up then. Karen, okay. thank you very much for being on board here. And uh, and like I said, links to your website are already in the show notes there below. So, uh, so check it out, folks. If you have any questions, comments, feedback, good, bad, or sideways to this episode, <laughs> leave it in the comments section below here on YouTube or at sensiblyspeaking.com. Always interested in any, any feedback you guys have on these shows and, and uh, where you think we should be going with all this. So, uh, again, Karen, thank you very much. Thanks, and Chris. Great to be with you. Absolutely. You too. Thanks a lot. And uh, see you guys next week. Bye-bye.